So today we will be talking about uh, giving incisions and basics of uh, raising scalp flaps and bone flaps. The basic rules for giving incisions that are done in GS or giving any incision, like you keep your knife perpendicular and cut with the belly of the blade, stay the same. But in neurosurgery, you have to plan your incisions accordingly. So incisions and definitions are being done for a long time, even in Neolithic period, we have evidence that people were doing uh, small trepanations, giving incisions, and giving sharp cuts on the skull. While in 19th century, with the event yeah, of metallic yeah. sharper tools, uh, trepanations were being performed. And Wagner mm -hmm. did the first osteoblastic flap in 1889, while Giggly saw for craniotomy was used in 1897. With the advent of electric gas powered drills and uh, imaging, uh, the modern neurosurgery was born. So this is a slide that I borrowed from one of uh, my senior residents uh, during residency training. Now here you can see the largest one was uh, one which was marked by the junior resident and the one which is going behind was marked by the chief and the one with hashes was marked by the consultant. Now it shows the increase in the understanding as you increase the level of training and the level of uh, uh, structures that you need to go to. So the basic bony landmarks are the one that you need to remember and you should know all these if you want to plan a good incision. The basic structures involved in uh, doing these are scalp, uh, dura and bone. For coming to the scalp, it's made of five layers, skin connective tissue, epineurosis, loose area rotation, peritoneum. So these are the structures that you need to go through if you need to go to your lesion in the brain. And you have to know the exact arterial supply, the neurological supply of these structures that you want to cut. So, interior supply to the scalp is basically from orbital, pro trochlear, and ophthalmic arteries, while lateral comes from superficial temporal, and posterior is from occipital arteries. You should learn an anatomy, and surgical anatomy is in much more detail than the basic anatomy that you learn. So, always go back and learn your anatomy in details. The venous connection is usually from diploe and the mysteries and the dual venous connections. The innovation is basically from uh, sensory innovation, supraorbital V1, yeah. auricular temporal as uh, the branch of V3, and the uh, cervical uh, plexus, which gives uh, occipital nerve, greater auricular nerve, and the great occipital nerve of Arden. And this is a sensory innovation. You don't need to know the small branches, but you have to uh, know the knowledge of the large branches that you will sacrifice while giving incisions. The motor elevation upper is from the facial nerve, temporal mandibular branch, which is usually one centimeter in front of the tragus, and the mastication innovation from the deep uh, temporal nerve of V5. So here's the innovation of the uh, facial nerve. You can see that there are very small branches that come in a pathway and in our area some inter uh, interest, especially in the temporal and carionic region. And this is basic dermatomes that you need to remember. So the frontotemporal branch has three main branches, anterior, middle, and posterior. Middle division is one centimeter anterior to the superficial temporal artery and is in the subgalial fat pad. And a section between the superficial and the deep layers of the superficial temporal fascia protects this branch from damage. So it's usually four centimeter posterior to the orbit. So whenever you read this fat pad, try to go below it. So the basic principles of neurotomy is preoperative review of the patient, preparation of the scalp, positioning of the patient on the table. If you don't position the table properly, you'll be bending yourself. So you'll be in difficulty. Scalp toilet, maybe using alcohol, povidone, preoperative baths. Everybody has different practices, but uh, you have to decide what you need to do. And making of incision, again, is also a very important part because it also has to take a number of considerations and draping.
you don't want to drive too less and you don't want to drive too large because if you drive too less you have to go cut the drives and go into an unsterile area which might not be fair and if you leave a lot of it open a lot of the area can get exposed so when you come to the scalp shaving how much you should shave usually a hairline or just a suture line is uh, okay and the evidence shows there is no increase in infections if you don't shave the whole of the head the neurovascular structures that you need to protect your incision should take into consideration what vascular structure should come from in and where the supply of your particle is going to come from and then location of the lesion you should always have your incision almost on top of that lesion you should always try to make a direct pathway the shortest pathway to your lesion then the hemostasis where the supply is going to come from and what structures can you compromise and previous scars and incisions that might be present in your incision area you need to take them into consideration and modify your incision accordingly and also you need to uh, keep in mind uh, you may need to extend your incisions uh, if the incision that you make is not adequate or you might be going for another surgery in the future so your incision right now has to take into consideration the incision that you might be making in the future the planning positioning of the lesion positioning of important structures contingency plan for enlarging incision and obtain adequate closure so while you're making an incision you also have to plan the how am i going to close it do you need to harvest peritoneum in the meanwhile and would do you need to take another flap or you need to prep another area while you positioning or doing that uh, surgery so the general principles still stay the same surgical exposure of the lesion neurovascular supply cosmetic effects is there a simpler or smaller way to do it and then flap type they can be random pattern flaps or they can be based on named vessels based on certain uh, big vascular supply the length again should not be more than 1.5 times that's a very general principle integrity of major vascular flap is to be maintained and incision should remain behind the hairline and there should be no cross incision making sharp edges so these important landmarks should be remembered they'll help you plan and even without neuro navigation you'll be able to localize your lesion quite accurately especially the large ones so while giving incisions uh, skin is incised with the galia keep pressure over the skin after uh, giving the incision to give hemostasis periosteum can either be raised with uh, with the scalp or without it when clips can be applied for hemostasis bipolar should be used with the uh, caution not too much bipolar it hinders with healing and hemostatic artery for slip or pressing clamps can be applied adequate retraction if you need to retract too much always extend your incision larger than lesser it can extend in the surface should be protected with moss gauze roller gauze should be placed on the folded side of the uh, flap to prevent the artery from kinking and dissect the interfacial fat which is contoured within 4 cm of the other two rim type of craniotomy can be a flap or a trephine again flap craniotomy can be oxoblastic or a free bone flap so the bone flaps give you more direct access to the target for cervical convexity directly centered over the lesions and number of bur hole varies depending upon the age of the patient the adherence of the dura and the place where you are actually operating and separation of the underlying dura is also different among children and the older people and the beveling effect you should try to bevel the edges to keep the bone flap from sinking and if the dura is lacerated during cutting retrieve your saw going back coming out from the entrance bur hole if you uh, open any air holes or sinuses remove the mucosa pack with betadine gel from pack with bone cells and cover it with the vascularized tissue now the proposed bony cuts over the venous sinuses should be done last you should do the safer bur hole first and the dangerous ones in the last so in case you have a rupture or bleed you have a very little bone to cut and vascularity and adherence should be preserved cut the sinuses and shown and tamponade it when they're necessary bony bleeds are stopped with bone wax pencil dissection is used to separate the dura epidural tacking sutures to control epidural bleeding before uh, opening the dura are helpful then they won't they let the blood trickle into your field and 
try to avoid doing this challenge. Now, when opening the dura, manually palpate the dura. You might feel the tumor right uh, underneath it. Dura is open in a straight, curved, or flap like incision, Mercedes incision, K shape, whatever, or C shape. Now, flaps are based towards the sinuses or towards the vascular supply, or usually towards the base if you're on the temporal size. Open with a sharp hook and a knife. Incision further open with dural scissors, keeping the structures underneath into vision ideally. And place a cotonoid along with the intended incision. Suitable cup of dura around the bone should be sent so, so that while you uh, when you come to repairing it, you have enough dura to pinch through. Now the closure should be in anatomical layers. Check the blood pressure of the patient before you do your closures. Uh, maybe it's too low and you have hemostasis, but as soon as the patient starts waking up, the pressure would get high and you will get bleed. If you have a watertight closure, try doing a valsalva maneuver to check for leakages, apply hitch stitches or tenting stitch in the center. Uh, dura should be watertight, but not in tension. If it's too tight, maybe you consider applying a draft and bone flap is replaced and skin closed in two layers. Now these are the different flaps that you can raise. Here you can see the bicoronal flap, the frontal temporal flap, and the suture flap. So in bicoronal suture flap, larger exposure for anterior cranial fossa or cella, frontal temporal lesions in the cranial base, superior dichromatic arch is about one centimeter to tragus and extend all the way to the bregma and on to the opposite side. It is reflected up to the orbital rim and gives you a very good exposure of the frontal and the frontal base. Supraorbital and proprio vessels are the ones this flap is based on. So this is the bicoronal flaps you might see. So frontal bicoronal bone flaps, suitable for frontal lobe, subfrontal approaches to the anterior skull base, and transcortical access to the ventricles. Again, if you want to decrease the size of the incisions, you have to modify. And depending upon the range uh, area where you go to, you have to modify your incisions. So frontal bone flaps are extended frontal or bifrontal craniotomy for exposure of cella and tear cranial base. Supine and head extended for these. Holes placed on either side for sagittal sinus and intervening bone. And either remove a single piece or conversion of the frontal flap to bifrontal bone. Combining the frontal flap with the terrional flap reduces the size of your incision. So in bifrontal and frontal flap, the goal of surgery dictates the craniotomy. Bilateral orbital craniotomies may be added to minimize the frontal lobe retraction. Dural opening for unilateral frontal craniotomy usually consists of a reflected uh, flap towards the sagittal sinus. And superior sagittal sinus may have to be ligated in bifrontal. Here is another example. Here you can see that a number of burr holes are seen and usually uh, on the sinus, you have two small burr holes on both the sides, or you can have a large one on the sinus. So the frontal flap, they expose the anterior frontal lobe. It begins along the coronal suture and curves anteriorly along the midline, preferably extending at the hairline. The temporal flaps are reverse question mark, the anterior temporal lobe and subtemporal axis. It is based on zygoma and goes behind the ear, extend anteriorly just behind the superior temporal line to the hairline. It does not go much superior, it stays below. Frontotemporal tyrional, popularized by Yafra uh, most often uh, useful for aneurysms and interior circulation, basal or tips, or the tumors, retroorbital parasol, and subfrontal areas. Supine position with the head elevated 30 degrees and rotated to the same or opposite side. So, frontotemporal flap is used for most tyrionic craniotomies, combines frontal and temporal skin flap. Yeah. Extend from zygoma to one to two centimeters of the frontal midline, following a curve behind the natural hairline. Temporalis muscle either dissected or reflected as a separate layer. If it is uh, separated, then a cuff should be uh, left on the bone so that you can stitch it back. In frontal bone flaps, temporalis muscle dissected or reflected. Bone flap centered over the therion, key bar hole, frontal bar hole. Is used and posterior bone hole usually required an older age where the dura is more adherent and large bone hole is just above the zygoma. Further bone may be removed from the inferior temporal squama and to improve the vision, drill <coughs> in our bridge, dual flap is based on the orbit. Here's uh, the section of the frontal craniotomy. Frontal orb uh, orbital zygomatic craniotomies can be done to give you a very extended approach and to allow 
for a more lower and interior approach. It is situated for paracellular interpeduncular lesions, basilar tip aneurysm, and cortico ophthalmic aneurysm. The question mark flap is usually made. Uh, it's a large flap for cranial trauma, exposes the whole hemisphere. It's based on zygoma, blood supply from the superior temporal and the supraorbital vessels. So the temporal vessel should be saved in trying to uh, raise these flaps because it's a very large flap and uh, it curves around 3.5 centimeter posterior to the external auditory meatus. Interior limb extends up to the hairline. Now in the posterior flaps, you can have a number of flaps like hockey stick, retro sigmoid, horseshoe, or metroid. The horseshoe exposes any portion of the cerebral convexity. It's an inverted U shape, which is based directed towards the vascular supply. Subtemporal exposure is usually anterior limb, one centimeter anterior to the tragus. And for anterior transdosal approaches, it's over the coronal suture. In the metro flap, it comes from the hats worn by the bishops. Occipital lobes, posterior facts, or the superior tentorial surface exposure is usually uh, done with it. Inion to the vertex, right. the vertical limb, and the upper limb can fall over the parietal region towards the air. Blood supply from the occipital artery. The linear or curvilinear incisions are really good for the suboccipital craniectomies, and they give you limited exposure, very simple to make and close. And hockey stick incision, linear incision for the temporal lobe can also be made and also for the subtemporal axis. In the CB angle femur, usually done in lateral prone, three quarter prone positions. Uh, for retro sigmoid suboccipital, you can usually have a vertical linear incision or a lazy S incision. You can also have a J or a hockey stick incision. The anatomical variants that come across during this incision are diacooked at diacoectatic vertebral artery or occipital artery or hypoplastic vertebral artery. So when closing, uh, always make sure you have to take all the layers of the scalp and also take the galea because just closing the superior layer would not cause hemostasis and cause bleed inside. And when you're uh, dissecting the muscles, avoid muscle shrinkage, try to preserve its vasculature, avoid uh, uh, damaging its nerve supply, and give blunt dissection with the scalpel with careful calculation, not too much calculation, it will decrease the size of the muscle. And it should have a wider lower particle to preserve its function and should have an atraumatic detachment. And reinsert if you did complete detachment, even if it's totally uh, off its particle. And trans osseous points of fixation will give back the functional purpose. The peritoneum, dissect it uh, and preserve it and keep it from drying because once it dries, it shrinks. And it's also a very good substitute for dural grafts. And when closing, it's possible it will contribute to bone formation in the craniotomy, especially in children. If you put the cranium ba uh, peritoneum back, they will have bone formation underneath. And while doing trephination, that you'll be doing in the workshop over here also, always see time to time where you're going and always feel time to time if you have reached the dura or not. <coughs> so the flap, has to be uh, of comfortable size. Make sure you know the craniotomy is not too small and also not too large. And don't waste your bone. Always try to save the bone that you cut off. You can always put it back and it will go back. And it should be uh, relative to the size of the dual opening that you might require. And try to keep away from the sinuses. So you can bevel the edges to avoid shrinkage, save the sinuses. And if you want to go to the base, always be flush to the frontal and the temporal area. If you want to go to the uh, frontal base, always be flush with the sinuses. And the number of drill holes may be different. And near the dural sinuses, it is difficult to peel off the dura from the midline and try not to do it. And these are dangerous with burr holes and they should be done in the last. While raising the dura, always strip off the dura from the bone and then give your instrument underneath and then feel the bow off uh, the dura under vision ideally. If you have a breach, always put another instrument over the previous one and then you can slide it off. And the flap, pedicle flap, if you're raising, it has a better vitality, but again, the osteoplastic flap requires more time. It has difficult hemostasis, uh, occasionally requires bone wax, blood loss is a little more. And embolism chances are also there if you're operating near the sinus. 
So this is an osteoplastic bone flap that you can see the pedicle is intact on the inferior surface and the blood supply to the bone is still there. And when your bone bleeds, always wax all the bleeders. And then the clothing, the transverse sutures and cranio fix uh, ideals really should be placed, but always keep in mind the price of the hardware that you're using. And, and you have to keep the bone fixed, it should not be moving because it said the part that moves is also one that gets infected. And you can use a bone powder, cranio fix, or cement, whatever you have for uh, immobilizing the bone. And when you're making the flap, go flush to the orbit, to the base, and bevel the edges to provide sinking. And in that temporal bone, go up to the base of the other goma if you want to go to the temporal base. Always uh, keep the anatomy of your sutures in your mind and always correlate your lesions with the sutures. It works as a new navigation of the poor. And if you mark them accurately, you'll be accurately at your lesion. Again, the frontal base and the temporal base the different flaps that you can raise. And dura itself, uh, we have age-related differences. In children, it's adherent and usually at the front fontanelles. In older people, it's more sticky, fragile, and usually splits into two layers. In the front end and the females, we might find hyperostosis, and the, at the bases, it's very thin. So the hemosis of the dura and the arteries uh, and the veins becomes difficult. Try to avoid coagulation of the dura because it causes retraction and causes more difficulty in the hemostasis. And avoid drying the dura matter and the pericranium because it shrinks, it will make the difficult closure. So when you tag the sutures, uh, try to avoid tagging the dura from the skin itself. Always use pericranium or bone. Don't burn your dura. And if you have uh, sinus damage, always use tamponade with cotton or surgical or you can put a muscular patch on it. So continuous opening the dura along the long lines and careful use with the scalpel, not cutting, but rather caressing it. And always open just the amount that is required, no more and no less. The dura protects the brain. And if you expose the brain, it is prone to get damaged. And while transfixation, use intradural sutures, don't go deep to the dura because you might take an artery or a vein while taking that stitch. And also, if you have the bridging veins, always cut them from the center, not from towards the sinus because it will shrink towards the sinus or not towards the brain because it will shrink toward, into the brain. Again, a small diagram to give you uh, the summary. Okay, I think that's the basic, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Mosin. We now have a uh, series of case scenarios. This will be conducted by Professor Said Nadari, Department of Neurosurgery, Health Sciences. Uh, Research and Teaching Hospital, Turkey. Dr. Saif. After that, Dr. Khaled Mahmood will follow him in this case. Uh, good morning, uh, your colleagues, students, residents. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Salma Sharif for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, actually, I uh, prepared three cases and some videos, but <laughs> here we have not enough time. And uh, then I will present you uh, on one case. Uh, I have questions here, but I, probably I cannot ask the people. Maybe, okay. Uh, okay, this case is uh, 22 years old, uh, young man. Uh, he, uh, he was applied to hospital after motor vehicle injury 80 days ago to other hospitals. 
with on and uh, neck pain, uh, head uh, deviated to the front and the right. There was uh, no neurologic deficit. And CT in the first uh, application uh, was, uh, as shown here, actually, when you look here, it seems there is no malalignment here. Uh, but when you look to this uh, axial view of the CT, uh, maybe this will be my uh, only one question. Uh, do you see do you see anything here? Yes, unilateral facet fracture with rotation. And, uh, yes, there is no actually big uh, or uh, over uh, malalignment, but we here we have uh, pedicle uh, and platelet separation uh, fracture. Uh, actually, uh, they sent patient to the home uh, because there was uh, normal alignment. And my, my other questions are: Can you define the injury? Actually, this is a lateral mass pedicle fracture separation. Uh, do we need uh, MRI? Actually, uh, in most of cases with cervical spine injury, currently we use MRI to see if there is traumatic cervical spine, traumatic uh, cervical disc herniation, or uh, soft tissue injury, or disco ligamentous injury. And MRI also will show us uh, spinal cord better than CT. Uh, you can see. Uh, epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, intramedular hematoma. Uh, therefore, in MRI is enough, but in the first uh, application, there was no MRI in this case. And the question is, in such a case, what is the treatment of choice? Uh, conservative uh, or surgery? Actually, for uh, type of the uh, surgery, we use many different scales. Uh, recently, we use SLIC, uh, cervical spine um, injury classification system. And based on SLIC, uh, we decide uh, to the treatment type. And of course, the other uh, question is the timing of the uh, surgery, if there is indication for surgery. I would like to show you the slip. Here we can see uh, this uh, scale has uh, two different components for uh, morphology of injury. Uh, if there is no problem, zero. Uh, it's uh, this is zero. And for compression, this is one. For burst fracture, two. For distraction, three. For rotation, translation, four. And uh, based on uh, this uh, presence or absence of the discoligament of injury, they receive zero, one, or two. And uh, for neurological uh, condition, they receive zero. And for complex spinal cord injury, two. Uh, for incomplete, this is very important, uh, they receive three points. And based on the slick uh, classification, if a case has uh, more than four points, there's indication for surgery. Uh, less than po uh, four points, there is uh, no indication for surgery. And for uh, four point is uh, gray zone. So when we look to uh, um, the city of the, this case, uh, lateral mass fracture separation uh, is one component of the translation rotation. Uh, which receives commonly four points. Uh, where you can hear uh, here in uh, translation rotation type of the injury, uh, we have different components: uh, unilateral facet fracture, bilateral facet fracture. You can see here facet here, this location, and facet in the other side. And for Fracture, this uh, lateral mass uh, uh, fracture separation also uh, four points. This ca case uh, came to a hospital 80 days after the first surgery with such a dislocation. And uh, MRI show 
Is the patient better? You can see here, fracture line here better. And here you can see fracture lines. See, there is a free floating facet complex here. So the uh, question is what to do? In this case, we uh, made a fusion from anterior reduction and uh, fusion from anterior and posterior. You can see here post-operative image. So my message is uh, use original detailed CT for injuries. Uh, whole spine CT may miss or underestimate uh, some findings that are mass ped uh, pedicle fracture separations receive four points in slick and uh, they should be accepted as unstable cases. Thank you.